I like feel like Beyonce right now. There's like lights and a microphone. That's really cool for me. Um, I do a lot of speaking mostly in conference rooms, so thank you so much. I'm really, really excited to be here because this is actually a brand new talk for me um, that I haven't done before, so having a nice, friendly audience is helpful. Um, but I do at Atlassian, so um, you probably have no idea what my job is, and it's okay, neither does my dad. Um, He's like, someone pays you for what? And so my job at a high level is that I help Atlassian more effectively attract, recruit, retain, and develop um, anyone who comes from an underrepresented background. So a lot of that is women, um, but also looking at racial minorities, um, LGBTI-identified people, veterans, people with disabilities, um, and even thinking about um, sort of late career people, so people over 40. Um, we think of a lot of those categories and often how they intersect. So I came to Atlassian about a year and a half ago um, after doing a stint at Palantir, uh, where I joined them uh, as a business development uh, person after dropping out of grad school, which is now apparently a trendy thing in Silicon Valley. Um, and I eventually transitioned into diversity and inclusion work there and then sort of made the jump to Atlassian as they decided to sort of kick off their global program around that. Um, to give you a little bit of an idea of what I do, one of the courses that I teach at Atlassian is on unconscious bias, um, which is kind of the hot topic nowadays. Um, but we spend a lot of time teaching people how to mitigate their own biases. Um, and over the last couple of months, I've become increasingly frustrated with the fact that we're not actually equipping women with tools and ideas of how to fight that bias while we're still figuring out how to mitigate it in workplaces. Um, I was perhaps uh, rage inspired by a really terrible op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. Um, a couple of weeks ago, if you saw it, uh, someone suggested that women just take their pictures and their first names offline to avoid bias. Um, and I don't think that women should just disappear in order to avoid bias. Um, so I said, here, let me come up with some actually useful suggestions um, that aren't sexist. So that's where this talk came from. Um, sorry, I'm like really no filter. Um, but so that's what this is about, is actually thinking about what unconscious bias is and then giving you tips and strategies to mitigate it or deal with it head on when you experience it in your career. Um, I am a social scientist by training, I'm super into, into experimentation to understand bias. And the first way I actually transitioned into diversity and inclusion um, was at my first job out of college. I helped the recruiting team understand how implicit bias was affecting female engineers. Um, and the way that they were actually being marked down um, relative to their male counterparts uh, during code screens at the beginning of the process. Um, again, driven by those unconscious decision-making points. And then we worked to actually rebuild all of the technical systems involved in that first step of the recruiting process, and we completely mitigated that difference between men and women. So it was great, because the, the company got to hire more awesome women, great talent, Woo! And it was research, which is fun, and someone paid me to do it, which was totally new after coming out of my PhD. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of the synthesis of how we got here, but I'm super, super excited to share this with you all. At the end, um, I love to do Q&A, uh, so I will do my best to give you advice based on the research that I know, um, or if other people have ideas that I don't have, I love discussion style stuff. Um, so that'll happen at the end. So first, um, interrupting bias in your career. Uh, the plain fact is that as a woman, um, or even as a woman of color, or a queer woman, or any of these other categories, you will have bias affect you in your life. Um, I didn't believe it when I started out. I was like, no way, that's never happened to me. I've never been discriminated against. No one's ever had a bias against me. Um, and as I've sort of progressed in my career, I've never found a woman who actually didn't experience some form of bias. Um, and that's because we interact with human beings and human beings have bias. So the best thing we can do is equip ourselves. So what is bias and where does it come from? Well, it turns out that our brains are actually really amazing machines, but that they don't always work perfectly. So back when we were making cave paintings like this, we actually had to make an incredible set of complicated decisions very, very quickly. So if I took too long to figure out whether I should pet or run from that saber-toothed tiger, I was not going to stand around to be anyone's ancestor in the first place, right? So our brain developed something called heuristics. At, at the basic level, a heuristic is just a rule or a pattern that our brain uses to understand the crazy amount of information that we're exposed to every day. But it turns out that these heuristics are incredibly simple models and so they often fail to capture the complexity of the decisions we're making. And when that heuristic leads us to an irrational or a bad choice, that's a bias. 
So a bias is an inefficiency in our decision-making process. Um, a really simple example, so I actually live uh, down Folsom Street, and I walk to work in the morning. And often there are people coming down the sidewalk walking towards me, right? Um, and we kind of naturally veer to the right and magically do not run into each other. Um, but I go to Sydney a lot because that's where my company is based, and the rules for walking there are quite different. Um, they have this nice little look here. Um, on, the, on the street so that tourists do not get run over. Um, but it turns out that I spend a lot of time doing this the first two days after I land and going, oh, I'm sorry, I'm American. Um, and it's because the heuristic that I have uh, to guide that behavior doesn't work outside of the context that I developed it for. So it works in San Francisco, but I have a bias in Sydney. So you can imagine that you use your heuristics millions of times a day. Um, things like, when was the last time that you thought about locking your house when you left? You probably didn't. It was an automatic behavior. It's a rule that your brain has used to cut down on the number of decisions that you have to make every day. So the scale of the information that I'm talking about here is enormous. Our brains are exposed to almost 11 million discrete pieces of information every minute, and it's completely impossible that we could process all of that data with our conscious mind. Um, so it turns out that our conscious mind can only process about 40 pieces of information in a minute, which means that almost 100% of every piece of information that we've ever come into contact with has been processed, categorized, and used by our unconscious mind to drive our decisions and behaviors, which means that we're not always sure what's driving the decisions that we come to, and it turns out that those biases or those inefficiencies in the system often most negatively impact people who come from marginalized or underrepresented groups. But the interesting caveat I should say is that all people have bias. Um, so the biases that you hold are less relevant based on your own identity than they are on the culture that you grew up in and the media that you were exposed to. Um, I really encourage everyone to check out the Implicit Association Test online. It's projectimplicit.org. Um, they have some really cool tests there where you can see what your own biases are. I do not suggest doing them all at once. It generally causes a giant crisis of self. Um, I've been there. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, but talking about my results for a minute. So I'm uh, Mexican-American, and I took the one about uh, brown people and white people, because I was like, oh, I'm going to ace this test. And then I took the test, and it said that I showed a strong bias in favor of white people, um, like something like 78% of the population, and I like freaked out for a minute. Um, but the idea is that we're all people and exposed to a lot of the same information, and so we form many of the same biases. Um, because our biases or our heuristics rely on stereotypes about people to make decisions. And it turns out that we all make decisions about people all the time. In the context of our careers, people also make decisions about us. They make decisions about whether to hire us, what projects to give us, whether they, what performance rating to give us, whether they agree when we try to negotiate for a raise, or who they name for a stretch project or a new leadership role. And so understanding how other people are thinking and how their brains are processing can actually give us a leg up, uh, because we can come up with new strategies to interrupt those biases for them. So it turns out that stereotypes are the basis of all of this. So Chimananda and Ghazi Adichie, a really amazing author, has a TED talk about stereotypes that I absolutely think you should check out. But she says, some stereotypes contain a grain of truth, some don't, and all are incomplete. And it turns out that these stereotypes that exist in our unconscious mind affect us, even if we don't consciously believe them. So we've certainly heard stereotypes like men are leaders, Muslims are terrorists. Women are not good at science and engineering. Even though the empirical evidence suggests that that is certainly not a blanket rule, um, our brains actually rely on those simple models in order to understand and categorize people. And talking a little bit now about a lot of the people in the room, um, stereotype threat is something that happens from that. Um, for this talk, by the way, I will generally talk about women. Um, I'm really big thinking about intersectionality and the way that our identities overlap, but I'm going to kind of stick to gender uh, for this audience. So stereotype threat 
Something that we experience often as minorities in which we actually experience more stress and anxiety relative to our majority group counterparts when we're in a situation um, where there's a negative stereotype that could be applied to us. So maybe it's a woman going in for an engineering interview. She's more likely to experience stress relative to her male counterpart, um, even in an already stressful situation, but then also more likely to engage in self-defeating behaviors that reinforce the stereotype that she was worried about in the first place. So that's not great. Um, I have certainly suffered from this myself. Um, but knowing that that exists, that that feeling exists, and being able to figure it out and check in with it is really powerful. Because you're able to say, hmm, no, I'm going to analyze this. A couple of other things. The confidence gap. So it turns out that women, on average, have a significant confidence gap relative to men. Women are socialized to not self-promote. They don't stick their hand up as much because they're socially punished for it. But it means that often an equally qualified man and an equally qualified woman will rate themselves very differently. Men are more likely to overstate their own competence, and women are actually more likely to understate their own competence. Or when looking at a set of requirements for a particular role or a level, they tend to say, oh, I'm not there, I'm not ready, even when they are. Know that that exists. Question it when you have that voice in your head. Um, because it turns out that throwing your hat in the ring is really important in terms of getting new opportunities. Imposter syndrome. Has anyone ever had imposter syndrome? Know what it is? Yeah, when I was in grad school, our professors used to sit us down every quarter and tell us that we were not stupid. Um, because most of us, after about three months, had decided that we were. What imposter syndrome is, is for really smart, high-achieving people, they actually believe that they are, in fact, frauds, that they are stupid, that they are not capable, their accomplishments are due to people, them tricking people into believing that they're capable of things. The smarter you are, the more likely you are to suffer from this, ironically. And also, if you possess one or more marginalized identities, you're more likely to, to experience this. Um, so coach yourself, right? Um, I all the time am looking out for this in others and myself. I experience it periodically in school and throughout my career. Um, and a lot of it is I find that talking about it and telling people that it's something I'm experiencing is really helpful. So I'm like, oh, do you remember that imposter syndrome thing? Yeah, you're not an idiot. Um, just if you need a reminder, or you can tweet at me and I'll remind you if that, that's cool. But now I want to talk a little bit about the types of bias that you might run into. We'll talk a little bit in theoretical, and then I'm going to go in to specific types of work situations that you can use. So performance bias is um, we, as human beings, actually struggle to assess how good someone is at something when they don't match the stereotype of who we expect to be good at it. What does this look like in practice? Well. This is one of the most well-known studies uh, done today on this, and it was kind of done by accident. So it turns out that a few decades ago, um, a lot of orchestras were predominantly male. In fact, at some of the same ratios that we see in engineering and tech today. And they said, well, why is this? And there were a couple of hypotheses. So maybe it's that women aren't interested in being in orchestras. Maybe women aren't professional musicians. Or maybe there was something about the process getting in the way of women taking advantage of that opportunity. And so they changed something about the audition process for orchestras. Previously, musicians would sit on the stage and reviewers would sit in the audience, watch someone play, and then decide who to offer the role to. And they made one tiny change. They put a screen in front of the auditioner so that the reviewers could hear the music being played but could not see who is playing it. Uh, also asked women not to wear things like high heels. Um, which would give it away. And it turns out for many of the orchestras that implemented this procedure, over the following years, five to 10, many of them became more than 40% female. So really strong evidence that information about someone's gender was actually clouding those people's judgment. And we're not talking about people who are misogynists or who are engaging in outright discrimination, but rather people's brains were not capable of mapping excellence and leadership onto women in that particular moment. Research actually shows that when you have groups of people list out male qualities and female qualities, 
they actually, and then asked them to uh, do qualities of leaders, so three different groups, that about 85% of the adjectives between the male list and the leader list overlap. Despite the fact, um, Harvard Business Review has published research that shows that empathy and uh, an orientation towards collaboration and emotional intelligence are actually some of the most valuable qualities in leaders. And those are often things that women excel at. Um, it's really interesting. Our stereotype is actually empirically just wrong. Um, the second, uh, second, yeah. This is the competence likability trade off. Um, so, this is something all women experience. Um, and what it is, is it comes from very different stereotypes that we have about men and women. So, for men, our stereotypes are that they are self promotional and they're focused on their careers, they're individualistic. For women, our stereotypes are that they are focused on their families, that they're concerned with group welfare, and that they're nice. And so when men and women, right, everyone's like nodding like, yes, I totally know what you mean. Um, every time I teach this, all the women in the room are like, there's a name for this? Um, <laughs> happened to me, it was like mind blowing. And so what happens is when men and women perform the same behaviors, they're judged very, very differently. And we see it show up in our language. Women are called assert uh, aggressive while men are called assertive. We call little girls bossy, while we tell little boys they have executive leadership skills. Women nag and men project manage, right? Everyone's like, yes, you're totally right. Um, and it turns out that there's empirical evidence on this as well. So someone that I really admire, Kieran Snyder, who is the CEO of a really great company called Textio, you should Google her, um, she did a really great study about performance reviews. And um, it's actually in Fortune if you want to read it. Um, but what it looked at was the performance reviews of high achieving people. And one aspect of what they, what they studied was the type of critical feedback that people received. And they looked at negative feedback. So and there are two types. There's skills-based feedback, so things like you need to meet deadlines or please learn JavaScript. And then there's personality feedback. So things like you're not collaborative or not a team player, your tone is a problem, you're too aggressive. And in the sample, it turns out that 85% of women received negative personality feedback in the sample. Only 2% of men received negative personality feedback. Um, about the fifth time that I taught this part in, in a class, I had a, a man in the class raise his hand and say, can I give you some feedback right now? And I was like, this is sudden and public, but sure. Um, and he goes, do you know how many exclamation points and smiley faces are in your emails? And I was like, uh, no, but now I do. Uh, <laughs> but it turns out that, right, it, it, I know about all of this, but it was affecting me. I'm like deeply concerned about coming across as stern or mean in emails. And so I'm like overcompensating, like go count all your exclamation points, it'll freak you out. I now like write my emails and then go back and delete half the exclamation points. So I look a little less like I haven't had 17 cups of coffee before I sent the email, um, right? But this feels like a thing. Uh, we as women, or at least me, I feel pressure to be nice all the time. And I'm in HR, so there's like, you know, job requirements that I'm nice. But um, when I talk to my, my male colleagues or my friends, they're like, no, I don't feel pressure to do that. You know, when I need to be assertive, I'm just assertive because I need to get things done. And it actually never really occurred to me that you had a different experience. Um, and so recognizing and acknowledging that feeling and when we have it, it's cool. Because it means that we can start building ways that we can overcome it in our workplaces or use it to our advantage. So first, job hunting, right? So we talked about the confidence gap. And it turns out that job ads on the whole are completely biased towards men. First of all, um, you've probably heard the statistic that women tend to apply to jobs when they have about 80% of the qualifications, while men tend to apply when they have about 30, <laughs> right? So throw your hat in the ring. Another thing is that there's language that women tend to avoid. So jobs like killer, rock star, ninja, guru, we actually tend to not apply to jobs that are described that way um, because we don't tend to identify with those things. 
Um, so throw your hat in the ring if you think you have a modicum of qualification. Um, my job at Atlassian, they were looking for someone with eight years of HR experience, HR experience um, with at least three years doing diversity and inclusion programs at a high growth startup, public ex speaking experience, like 17 other things. I had like half of that. And by half, I mean I had a year and a half of work experience and six months of HR experience. So no, the job descriptions are not real. Um, right? You're like, that looks interesting. Let me apply for that. Um, because it turns out that a lot of times people don't know what they're looking to hire for until they see it. And there's nothing bad that can happen if you send your resume in and you don't get a job. Because you still don't have the job, right? Like nothing has changed. Except maybe you might get feedback or a really cool interview. Um, so think about that. Think less about am I qualified and more about would I find this compelling to do. Because if you can tell that story, I can tell you from being in recruiting, I would much, much rather hire someone that's slightly less qualified, that is super jazzed about the job, than someone who's been doing it for 15 years but is bored by it. So again, you and your passion, your authenticity can actually overcome whatever uh, confidence you may not have yet. Um, nerves, anxiety. So it turns out that interviews are really terrifying right, always, but recognize that that, Im that stereotype threat and that imposter syndrome might be affecting you. So, right, oh, I don't know if I'm good at this. I don't know if I'm going to do well. Um, it's okay. One, practice is great. Practice with your friends. Practice online. There's a ton of really cool software out there right now that can help you. Uh, Interview.io um, sometimes runs uh, things where they will help people prep for interviews. Uh, Carrot, K-A-R-A-T, is another, another one. It's job hunting, but they do a lot of interviewing. So there are ways that you can get great practice. Um, but recognize that that nerves and that anxiety might be driven by something completely different than how qualified you are for the role that you're going for. Third thing is negotiation. Everyone hates it. It is the most uncomfortable thing <laughs> I've ever had to do. And it turns out that research shows that when women um, advocate for themselves, so this is that competence like ability trade off, um, they tend to actually be socially punished for it. So we know that women don't negotiate, but it turns out that a lot of that is because we've learned the rule that we get in trouble if we do it. It's a really, really great way to get around this. Um, so I used this at my last job and it worked, so there, there's my success story, um, which is I don't negotiate. I tell people what they can pay me, um, right? So do your research, do your data. But rather than negotiating, figure out the lowest number you're willing to accept and then offer a range. You know, if you, if you really need a minimum of $100,000 in your role, say, oh, I would accept 100000 to 120000 and, you know, plus whatever else, goodies, benefits, perks, whatever you want to negotiate. Um, and if they come back and give you an offer in that range that meets your other requirements, take it. Right, you've already set the floor on what you wanted, so you have the advantage. Um, it's something that turns out that women aren't punished when they do that because they look really agreeable. Like, oh yes, I'll take your offer. Cool, all of those social punishments, gone. And you still got the money you wanted. Yes. Uh, one of my like personal heroes is Cindy Gallup. Um, whenever I'm having a bad day, she's like pure girl power. She's like all the Spice Girls in one person. Um, but she has this talk where she's like, the only way that we're going to make serious progress on this if women just start making a lot of fucking money. Um, and I'm like, yes, let's all do that. Um, her advice is ask for the biggest number that you can say without laughing. Um, and I'm like, I can tell you it worked. Um, I literally made up a number the last time I negotiated, and they were like, sure. So really confused and bewildered, but I was like, okay, I'll take it. Thanks. Um, so serious, um, Glassdoor, salary.com, um, the best thing that you can do if someone comes back and says no, you say, well, this is the going rate for this role. Um, and you have California on your side, which is now the laws are actually changing January 1, so that people don't just have to be paid the same for the same job title, but also for substantially similar jobs. So especially if you're a specialist, I struggle with this because there are very few heads of diversity and inclusion at high growth startups, <laughs> um, is I actually had to compare myself to marketing roles um, because it was the only thing I could find at the same level. So think creatively about how you're doing those comparisons and come armed with data and don't negotiate. Give them a range that's acceptable and maybe have some you know, benefits or negotiating things on the side. But get your money, right? Beyonce, it's a Beyonce reference, right? Get that paper, brought it back. <laughs> Yes. So team dynamics. It turns out that once we get the job, we actually have to go to work with people. Um, right? I guess unless you're a remote worker, which 
actually, this would still apply. So it turns out that there's a lot of patterns that we as women experience in the workplace that we can, we can interrupt. So the first is interrupting. Um, I actually think this is also a Kieran Snyder study uh, published in Slate, where she showed that women were twice as likely to be interrupted while speaking in meetings. That sucks. Um, because it turns out that both men and women do the interrupting. It's just that women are the ones who tend to get interrupted. So you can do like Hillary Clinton in the first debate and just keep talking, um, but that's generally really awkward, right? <laughs> um, I would do that, but I generally don't think other people are quite that extroverted. Um, but what you can do is actually find a buddy. So I do this all the, uh, if you have, it can be another woman, right? Team up, allies are cool. You got male allies, that's even better. Um, but have someone actually watch for that for you. When that happens, have them interrupt it for you. Um, because, like I said, we have this competence, like ability double bind. Sometimes when we try to interrupt it for ourselves, people will think we're being difficult, right? How many times have I've been called aggressive? Um, more times than I can possibly count. Um, but have someone do that for you. Oh, hold on, I wanted to finish, um, I wanted to finish, Sarah to finish what she was saying. Um, or can you go in a sec? You know, I need a little more time on that idea. That's really, really cool. Um, the other sort of facet of that is as women, um, often as um, other types of minorities, introverts as well, our ideas tend to be taken and co-opted by those around us. Um, and that's because people are actually more likely to take ideas from people with majority group identities. And the women in President Obama's cabinet actually came up with this really crazy, cool way to interrupt that, which was when a woman in the room had a great idea, one of the other women said, that's an awesome idea, Karen. And so they've now created space where those people are getting credit for the ideas that they're coming up with. Um, that's something you can do, right? You find a buddy, you find a friend on your team or on a team that you, you work a lot with. You can work together because there's this other side benefit, which is when women advocate for each other, they all get social points, right? So you can help someone else, they help them, and suddenly you've removed yourself from this trade-off while still just showing off the brilliant ideas that you have. Second thing is office housework. Women, on average, tend to do this. They advocate, they organize the meetups, they send the calendar invites, they clean up the room after the meeting's done. Don't do it. Don't do it unless someone's paying you to do it, um, because you don't have to. Or if someone is insisting you do it, say, hey, I would love to put this on a schedule. I think we should all contribute to it. We can do it like the chore wheel in college, right? Um, that's a really good way because at the end of the day, if you're not getting compensated for at work, you shouldn't be doing it. Um, I am so guilty of this. I was the social chair of my sorority and my grad school class. I'm like, I'll do it all. Um, but it actually was really distracting and it took away from my core job. Again, with negotiation. A um, little bit ne different this time. So you can't just come in with, a, with an offer when you're trying to get a raise or something. But what you can do is educate someone about the bias that they might feel. Um, and I can tell you because I have done this. Um, walked in and said, hey, I'm here to negotiate. And I understand that you're gonna feel uncomfortable and might dislike me because of that, because people tend to feel that way when women advocate for themselves. I wanna call that out so that we can have a really objective and productive conversation. Um, because it turns out that research shows that really, really well-timed reminders about bias actually cause people to engage in less of it. So, really easy, right? Call out this thing that's in the room, and then suddenly you can have that productive conversation without facing the social penalties that you might have otherwise. And you're still gonna get that money. <laughs> and then career mobility. Um, oh, I'm interviewing here. New slides, I told you this was a new talk. Little kinks. Um, performance reviews. So this is actually something that I did <laughs> just two weeks ago. Um, but again, thinking about that competence, like ability, double bind, I was like, oh, well, I'm gonna give myself a really good rating because I think I crushed it this year. Uh, but I was like, oh, I actually totally trust my boss. She's great. Um, but I said, you know, I wanna try something, right? Because I gotta live what I teach. And so at the top of my performance review, I wrote, when women engage in self-promotional behavior, they often face social penalties and are seen as aggressive and not a team player. I'm calling attention to this pattern now as a tool for the reviewer so that they can have an objective assessment of what follows. Right at the top. And then I wrote that I was awesome and I crushed it. Um, in a few more words than that. Um, again, not because I don't trust the people that I'm working with, but because, again, I'm advocating for myself in a way that's educational. 
it comes across as I'm trying to help you do something. So I'm, I'm using the fact that I'm expected to be helpful, couching my language in helpful language. So I'm just sailing over all those expectations. Um, yeah, that's all I've got for this. Um, Right? No, but with career mobility, so the same thing, is if there are leadership development opportunities, put your hand up. If there's stretch projects that you want, put your hand up. Especially, it turns out, new research that just came out a few weeks ago actually shows that the number one predictor of people getting, um, getting promotions, of getting selected for leadership roles, is actually the visibility of their work. Um, and again, because of that confidence gap, we actually tend to be less likely to put our hands up for it, but it is the stuff that helps us move upward. And then we can negotiate, right? Practice again, get more money. Um, but really, it also means that you get greater scope of work, you get greater control and greater leadership. Um, and very, very rarely um, do those types of things come to people who just have their heads down and aren't saying, I want more, I want more. I wanna do more things, I wanna keep learning. Um, so remember that you may have that confidence gap and that everyone has it. It's just that we as a society have socialized men not to listen to it, um, whereas we've told women to listen. Don't listen. Yeah. That's all I've got from content, but I'm excited about questions. Yeah. So I can tell you what I would do. Um, your mileage may vary. I actually tend to actually respond with the research and say, I totally understand why you're having that reaction. It turns out that when we perceive that women are being stern, we actually tend to dislike them and think it's inappropriate, even though when men do the same thing, we wouldn't have the same judgment. I'm happy to point you to some research on that if you're interested. Um, yes, I actually talk like that to people. Um, <laughs> my team has a rule that if I don't say study show at least five times in one day, I must be ill. Um, but I actually do that because I think leading with education and appealing to people's best selves is actually the best way to get attitude change. Um, and because, yeah, I've actually, it's, um, personally, it's often been women who have been like, oh, you're being really aggressive, right? Because they're like, oh, I don't wanna get like the like halo punishment for like you being up here, you know, being like, give me more things. Um, and that's because we've been socialized to act like that, right? We've learned the punishment for not doing it. Um, and so it can be really, really hard for people to break that. Um, and so part of doing that is saying, hey, I'm gonna open the door to you so you understand what's happening. So you can actually have a more thoughtful process about analyzing both your own existence um, and how you deal with other people. I would become a project manager, right? You're like, I'm in charge of the birthday. Okay, I need you to order the food and I need you to do this. Like give everyone else the jobs or like at least assign jobs to different people. So then when you can come back, right, in performance review season or when you're in a, in a feedback session, um, just be like, hey, actually, I wanna think creatively about the ways that I've demonstrated these skills. Like I wanna take on this new project. Did you notice how smoothly I handled this thing, right? And so you actually turn it into a career development thing and articulate that because no one is going to get it if you don't tell them, <laughs> right? Like, people have a lot going on. Um, so using those things as examples. So if you, if you love doing them, um, you should have told me that because I hate parties for me, but I love throwing them for other people. Uh, Misha and I used to work together. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's how I would do it. Um, not that I'm constantly only thinking about upward mobility in my career. Sometimes it like, just feels really good to make other people happy. Right, like altruistic, You're like yes, I had a good day, someone smiled. Um, but that's why I would do it, is every single thing that you do in the office is a skill that can be used to grow your career. Um, and think creatively about what that means. I talk about this a lot actually um, with folks who come from non-traditional backgrounds. I find that people who come from, you know, didn't go to Stanford or MIT, you know, don't have the kind of career training um, that those kind of students have. But learn how to turn your skills and experiences into the language of business. So you grew up in a bilingual household, you're skilled in cross-cultural communication. Um, you worked in school to support your siblings. You're able to execute on time sensitive projects with financial constraints and multiple stakeholders, right? Like, oh, that sounds fancy and businessy. But like, you can do that, right? And when someone asks you about it, be like, yeah, I actually worked a job while I was going to high school because I was supporting one of my, my siblings. That's a really impressive story in a job interview. Like, I wanna hire that person always. Um, and so it's really just about translating all the cool things about you and that you're doing, whether it's at home or in the workplace, um, into things that employers understand and bosses understand. So if you could back up a little bit, something I think would be great is if you get that pile of resumes, you have the women that you awesomely sourced, and those men cut the names off the top, and then hand it to the interviewers and say, I want you to stack rank these. 
um, because I can tell you from research that women tend to pop to the top of the pile when you do that. Um, right, so then you're actually just forcing them to be like, oh, these people are really competent and I would want to interview them. Um, so that's, that's another thing that's really great. Something that we found at Atlassian that's actually really helpful because you can't anonymize once someone is on site. That's really creepy, like putting them behind a screen and a voice scrambler. Right? Like no one is going to accept your job offer. Um, <laughs> you can't do that. So what we actually did, um, an experiment where we flipped um, the order that we did our interviews. So it was for engineering interviews, and we used to start with the technical and the coding interview, and we actually put that at the end. So we did the management, leadership, and values interviews first, um, which we found, a s and frankly, women just tended to do really well in those, um, and then gave them the technical interviews later. And what we were able to do is build up momentum and positive sentiment for those candidates. Um, again, still empowering the hiring team to make the right decision, make the decision they thought was best for the team, um, but doing it in a way that was manipulating the environment so that the female candidates had a better chance of really showing the competency that they had. Um, that's a really good thing, like just slice the tops off resumes. Yeah, so I think the first thing, if you can, is um, look out for allies, especially people from majority groups. There's usually like one guy who's deeply uncomfortable and the other guy's like, oh, she's hot, and they're like, what is wrong with you? Um, but so look for that person can be really helpful because it turns out that when we get those kind of messages from people who look like us, we're a lot more amenable to them. Um, so male allies are fantastic. Um, my, I've been in that situation, actually, and my advice, what, I mean, what I did, to be totally honest, uh, it was one of the reasons I dropped out of grad school. It wasn't, it wasn't overt, I just felt like I hit a bunch of brick walls and I wasn't gonna get over them. I went and did something else. I was like, I'm taking my brilliance elsewhere, bye. Um, which, you know, you can't always do that, but I think that's something to always look for because one of the cool things happening in tech right now is it's becoming really obvious which companies care about these types of things and which don't. And at the end of the day, the companies that care, the companies that are actually attracting all of the talent that exists and not artificially cutting off half their potential workforce are the ones that are gonna win. Because your IP is everything. Um, and your IP comes from the minds of brilliant people that you hire. So that's another thing is if it doesn't work, keep your eye out for something that looks awesome and interesting and has a culture that you want. Um, but find buddies, find people who are gonna at least take you for a beer and commiserate if you're not in that position where you can make the move um, because those people usually exist. Um, they just tend to not be the loud ones. Yeah, I generally tell them it was mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, but the, like, the gentle way to do that if you're, you're not me, I think everyone has kind of learned to work around me is be like, hey, is, hey, actually I said something really similar before. I'm really excited that we're on the same track. Um, which I'll be totally honest kind of sucks to like give co-credit for something that you feel like was yours. Um, but if you're not comfortable just being like, I said that first, um, which I am, um, sort of softening it with that can be a way to build up the confidence to be able to do that. Um, the other thing is I would, again, I think finding a buddy is like the best thing. Finding someone who's gonna advocate for you, um, who can do that, who can watch out for when that happens. Um, it works with interrupting, it works with idea co-optation. Um, and I would say it's a bigger deal if someone does it intentionally and repeatedly than if it happens unconsciously. Um, because I can't tell you how many meetings I've been in um, where in you know, sort of a majority male environment where I'd say something and the group kind of says, mm, no, I don't think so. And then like 10 minutes later, um, a guy says almost the same thing and the group's like, yes, that's brilliant. And I'm like, say what? Um, but yeah. So that's how I would, I would deal with it in a meeting setting. Um, the other thing is if I had a really great relationship with the, the team lead or there, I would say something like that, like, hey, I think a lot of our ideas are getting muddled and I wanna make sure that everyone gets appropriate credit. Um, that's something I think that you should look out for in the meeting, um, which doesn't actually come across as self-advocacy, even if it is. Um, it looks like you're advocating for the other people around you. So again, using that competence like ability trade off to your advantage um, while still getting people to do the things that you want. Um, the other really great thing, especially in tech, people love data. They love data and they love studies. Um, so you can actually say, hey, do you know that when this happens, um, you know, the way that teams perform better is when everyone is getting their ideas on the table. It's where innovation comes from. There's tons and tons of literature on this. You know, like type in tech diversity in Medium and you'll get like 35 articles immediately. 
um, but look at Scott Page. Um, McKinsey has a ton of research on why diversity is useful. Um, Harvard Business Review does a ton of really easy to read studies um, because if you can get the managers, this is what I found on board with, that sort of conflict of ideas and sharing is actually what drives great collaboration and great products or great, I guess, work products broadly. Um, People tend to be really amenable to that. That's sort of their in incentive. Often they just don't realize what patterns are happening, especially you know for men, it's never happened to them or has happened to them incredibly rarely. Um, so they just don't have a sense of empathy or understanding of those patterns and those experiences. So you got to do a little education, shine a light, um, show them how your experience might be a little bit different. Yeah, help yourselves and help each other. So whether you're at the same company or not, um, I'm like up here talking about like I'm an expert, like I'm not sitting at home. Sometimes like, oh my God, how am I gonna get fired? Like everyone's gonna think I'm crazy. Ah, yeah, so I experience that too. So look at you're not alone. Um, no, I get that all the time. I just practiced. Like I literally, there have been, this is weird, um, when I've like gone into like a salary negotiation or like something I thought was a hard meeting, I literally practiced like 10 times like staring at myself in the bathroom mirror. Because the more that I say it, um, because at the end of the day, you're always gonna feel that discomfort, but the more that you let yourself feel that discomfort in a safe place, you get used to pushing through it. Um, so it's kind of the same thing with public speaking. Like I used to be terrified of doing it, and then I fell off a stage, and I was like, well, I can't go anywhere down. I literally can't go down from here. Um, <laughs> it was like 10 years ago, thank goodness. But, so, but in, all, in all seriousness, practicing it with a group of girlfriends or male allies or just whoever you feel safe talking about, and it can be a really great way, like, um, so my fellow heads of diversity and I, um, I don't think I'm supposed to talk about this in public, but we have something we call empathy wine. Um, there's a silent H. We get together with wine and wine at each other um, about things that are bothering us at work. Hi, Rachel, if you're watching. Um, but have those moments, right? Those like safe spaces, if that's the only place you can practice and you feel comfortable. Um, because I think understanding and recognizing that like pit that you have in your stomach, the more you're just like, oh, felt that before. It's not that bad. The sky didn't fall. Um, and then try little things, right? You don't have to like march into your salary negotiation next week if you've never done that before. Um, but think about it, is it, is it that you're gonna not be interrupted? And you're just gonna do something like, oh, I just had one more thing. And you're, that's the only thing you're gonna practice for the next two months, is just when you get interrupted, say, oh, just one more sec. Right, that's not crazy confrontational, but those little wins, right, you'll be like, oh, I can do that. Right, and then maybe the next thing is, the next time someone you know, co-ops an idea or borrows an idea that you've had, say, oh yeah, I said something similar earlier. I'm really glad that you were able to take it further. Right, and those are sort of gentle ways of doing it if you're not Aubrey and like crazy research person. Also like flea markets and things like that, if you wanna practice, no, I'm totally serious. Like I actually got better at negotiating after I lived in the Middle East and I spent a lot of time like, like negotiating over the prices of things because it just wasn't weird to talk about money. Um, by the way, legally, I'm just here to tell you that you are allowed to talk about your salary. You are allowed to talk about how much money you make and I totally believe that women should do that um, because that knowledge is power. Uh, you can talk about it, your employers cannot retaliate against you, that is literally illegal. Um, so be aware that you can do that. Because um, that can also be really powerful if you trust people at your company, ask them what they make, Is that does that make sense with what I make? So that you have the knowledge when you go into a conversation about that. That's an awesome suggestion. Yeah, I think it's, it's a totally a personal choice. So I made the choice to be like, dial it down, Aubrey, because I was like dialed up to a 15. Um, which is kind of how I exist in the world. Um, but yeah, I think it's a personal choice. I think part of it is, like my question is, why do you think that's going to hurt me? What do you think the outcome of that's going to be? Um, because if someone can't articulate that, right, you've kind of illuminated to them that they're like, why am I telling you to do this, right? Um, but doing it again, that non conversation like, hey, I don't really understand. I've never heard that feedback before. Can you tell me what you think like, will happen, right? Like, I mean, I do this, right? I know exactly what they're talking about, but I'm like, explain it to me like I'm an idiot. Um, because a lot of times it will reveal that they don't have a lot of logical basis um, for it. And I found that actually those types of moments are like the best ways to create allies. Because they're like, that's nuts, you're right. And then we can like high five over the fact that that's weird. And now we just learned about it and we can combat it. So that's what I would do. My favorite is, what do you mean by that? Favorite question. Uh, they're not a culture fit. What do you mean by that? 
I hate, by the way, culture fit as a concept. Absolutely. Um, steal men's confidence. Um, totally, right? Just be like, I am awesome. I dare you to challenge me on that, right? It's like the same thing Misha's like, I deserve more money, challenge me. And like, people don't want to, right? They're like, oh yeah, you're right. I do, I should pay more money. Or, oh yeah, you should be running this project. Um, so being like on, I, I think of it as on the offensive, right? Being on the defensive is like waiting for someone to give you a project and being on the offensive is like, hey, I think I would do a really good job at this thing coming up. I'd love a chance to do it. Um, and so you don't need to say it in a way that's masculine, but again, just adopting the confidence, sort of the underlying principle. Even if you don't feel confident, pretend like you are. Do the power pose thing in the bathroom if it helps you. Um, I feel too awkward to do it, um, to tell you the truth, because like people walk in and then I just like collapse into giggles. Um, but I think you should co-op the confidence for sure. Um, and I think if there are strategies that you can borrow from men, like Misha just talked about, that's great, right? You're not changing who you are, you're changing how you're negotiating. Um, but I don't think that women should sacrifice their femininity, especially not their empathy and their collaboration skills, because frankly, that's what makes us really good at things. Um, I just read this fantastic, um, really long form essay called Why Women Make the Best Product Managers. Um, and the thesis was just about the way that women are able to bring things together because a lot of it is we've been socialized to be really good at that. Um, but we should actually talk about those things in a business way, right? Um, so actually, I'm, you know, I'm a really high empathy person. So it's really easy for me to understand the needs of my customer. And so I'm actually be able, better able to articulate what features are going to create utility for them if you're a product manager. Um, so I would say you should highlight those strengths and talk about them, but in the same way that I would coach someone who grew up in a bilingual household to be like, I'm awesome, give me you know, a job because that's a cool skill, I would say do the same thing. Talk about it in the same way that men talk about a get shit done attitude. Um, if you talk about it like a value, you're asking someone to guess that you're wrong. And people like don't do that, that's weird, <laughs> right? So that's playing the offensive, is using that male tactic, but doing it in a way that's authentic to you. Um, yeah, I tend to be a little more masculine on like the, I'm just gonna charge in and do this side. Um, but yeah, I, but I've seen a lot of women who actually come in, um, my current CHRO, um, she is like solid and totally confident and, and all of that, but I would not say that she's like exhibits masculine qualities, right? She's highly empathetic and thoughtful and like clearly, clearly very authentic to herself. But those things about the way she sits, the way she takes up space at the table. Um, so like she like raise her straight back always, arms like here, right? Because we tend to do this. I do, I put my elbows on the table. So borrow those tools that you can use that still feel real, like you can do them. Um, and then throw everything else out and explain to people why what you have is really awesome. Um, because if one person doesn't listen, someone eventually will, right? Especially around here, I can tell you working for a tech company that like the only thing we care about is acquiring really, really good talent. And there are obviously biases and, and things in place, but at places that are working to change those things, you're gonna land something awesome, or you're gonna land upward in an awesome way. Thank you. Yeah.